go straight in. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Hi everyone. I hope uh, I hope you can all hear me now. Can I get a a wave or a hello if you can hear me in the chat, just to make sure everything's running okay? Okay, so, right, I think we're up and running. Okay, so thank you for everyone t for turning up. Thank you for attending. Uh, thanks for spending your evening or the next half an hour to an hour with me. Um, small piece of background, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've bootstrapped a couple of different businesses to six-figure revenues. I'm now based back in my sort of home country of Wales. I'm in the city of Cardiff right now. Um, but a few years ago, I lived in Bulgaria for two years and I spent six weeks helping entrepreneurs in Skopje and also six weeks helping entrepreneurs in Tirana in Albania. So um, I've spent over two years in the Balkans, uh, so I know it and I love it. And uh, hopefully I have a, a good understanding of um, the needs of, of Macedonian uh, entrepreneurs. And so I'm gonna to try today to, to help with some of the fundamentals and one of the biggest problems I see, um, which is really just understanding if your if you're good idea is a, uh, a, a good business. And I think those two, I think as entrepreneurs, we very often get very emotionally attached to our, to our business um, and or our to idea. And we don't think about whether it's a good business. So what I'm gonna, quickly talk to you about today um, is how to understand that and by going through processes and speaking to your customers you can understand that um, and then I'm going to give you a, a basically a, a case study of something that we did uh, that proved that it was it worked before we spent any time and money on it so the first bit of my talk is a little bit about um, speaking to your customers which is uh, any of those, those of you who uh, attended Kathleen's webinar the other day, you'll recognize some of this stuff. So I'm going to go over it really, really quickly and just dig into some, some slightly different bits uh, from what Kathleen did, but fundamentally it's very similar stuff. And then the main part of the presentation will be about the case study. So first and foremost, these are my details. If you want to get in touch with me, you can right here. Um, this is obviously the, uh, the basics of my um, presentation, but it's about the things I'm going to talk about today can be applied to pretty much anything. Um, it doesn't have to be um, a business, it can be marketing processes, which is what I'm going to show you as well. Um, so, the top 20 reasons startups fail is there is literally no market need. Um, which is crazy, right? Because we always just assume that when we have a business idea, it's because there's a business need. But I guarantee that people smarter and better than me uh, have launched businesses with lots of money and lots of great energy and failed because literally nobody wanted what they had to sell. Um, so we really need to understand that very, very clearly um, because it's very, very easy for us to get into the the idea that, that actually people want want what we're selling. So as a perfect example of this, some, some question I ever ask, uh, I often ask is, have you ever spilled a glass of water? Or sorry, actually, I'll rephrase that. Is there anybody here who has never spilled a drink? If you have never spilled a drink, I want you to say so in the live chat. Um, and I'm guessing that that means that nobody has ever not spilled a drink. Of course, everyone spills drinks, right? So if I came up with a solution to spilling your drink, I'm gonna give you three quick solutions to not spilling your drink, right? One is a lid that you take around with you and you put on the top of every cup, regardless of whether it's a mug for your coffee or a glass of wine. Uh, it's a lid that you can put on and it fits every cup. And there's also something you can put on the bottom of every cup that just makes it very, very difficult to knock over. And thirdly, I've designed an app which sends you a message every five minutes that says, don't spill your drink. Now, of course, nobody's gonna uh, by any of those three things so there is a huge market need or you think there's a huge market need because everybody on the planet spills a drink 
but it is not solving a big enough problem for those people to want to change their behavior or spend money. Because I certainly wouldn't do any of those three things. I wouldn't carry around a lid to put on the top of my drink. I wouldn't put something on the bottom of my drink. And I wouldn't want an app that reminds me not to spill my drink. That's ridiculous. But it's really, really easy to think just because there is a big market, it solves a big problem. And that's the thing you really need to understand. Are you solving a big enough problem for people to want to change their behavior and spend money? So... Kathleen actually mentioned this book. I think it's the most important business book I've ever read. Um, Rob's, Rob, the author of this book, his theory is basically um, everybody lies to you. So if you walk up to somebody in the street and say, hey, do you like my new product? Do you like my app? Would you use it? They're going to say yes. And the reason it's called the mom test is because if you ask your mum, then of course your mum's going to say yes because your mum loves you, right? And that's her job. She basically says yes to everything. You ask her because she went, although I gave, gave a similar talk in Skopje uh, a couple of uh, last year or the year before, and I said this, and somebody said to me, not Macedonian mums. And I was like, okay, maybe, maybe not Macedonian mums. But, but basically the whole point is people lie to you. So what you have to do is ask questions that make it impossible for them to lie to you. So instead of saying, um, I have an app that does this thing, do you like it, would you use it? You go and ask them about their problems. And, and Kathleen touched on this. It's like, you know, you go and talk to them about their, their, their life in the area that you're interested in. So Rob used the, the, uh, the idea of a cookbook that's on an iPad. Um, and actually, he demonstrated that by asking the right questions of the mum, like, how often do you use your iPad? What do you use it for? Do you have enough cookbooks? You know just never mention the idea of an app because the, m the second you mention the idea of an app you have limited their scope that what they th that what they're thinking about but if you ask about a whole range of different things then what they can actually do is give you all the problems they're experiencing and your app might address a problem that is here but they might have a really big problem that exists just here and if you just ask the right questions they might tell you about this problem that's just here but if you just present them with the app, they can only answer questions about the problem that exists over here because that's the only way they're thinking is what problem does this app solve? But there might be a bigger problem just here. So an example, um, a really good example of this is um, a website where you can upload a, a spreadsheet and it creates lovely graphs like this, beautiful graphs. Uh, and they had lots and lots of people using it, but nobody was upgrading to the premium model, which was where... Um, they made their money, right? They basically had um, uh, people would use the free version but not really use the uh, premium model. And so they went and spoke to all of them like, hey, do you like our service? Like, yeah, it's great. We use it to create our monthly reports for our boss. And there's lots of people who worked in big, boring companies who use this, this product for their boss. Um, and they were like, okay, great. So why don't you spend $5 a month or whatever? And they kind of gave them some answers, but it didn't really help. But when they actually asked the questions properly, they used mum test questions. They asked their customers the right questions. They basically found out, they, they thought the problem that they were solving was creating graphs for people who work in big organizations to put in monthly reports. But when they went and spoke to these people, they said, oh, so how do you feel about your report? Oh, I hate doing my report. So why do you do it then? Well, because my boss asked me and he, you know, and then he doesn't really read it. He kind of gets it and he kind of flicks through it and then he throws it in the bin. It's like, well, why on earth do you do this report, right? And the guys that they spoke to, and it was normally like these boring men who worked in middle management, and almost all of them came back and it's like, well... It's because it makes me look good to my boss. Like, I can put these beautiful graphs in and it makes it look like I've put lots and lots of time and effort in. And they were like, oh, so the problem we're solving here is not creating beautiful graphs for you. The problem we're solving is making you look good to your boss. And when they understood that, they added some more functions to the website that helped these people create, uh, create monthly reports that made them look good to their boss. It made them look 
like they were putting in a lot more effort than they were so that they got their annual bonus, right? So it wasn't just about creating the graph. So if you write, ask the right questions, and that's what this book really strongly recommends you read it, but if you read that book, it takes like three hours to read, and it's really, really it's just amazing. Um, I strongly recommend it. So that's a really, really quick rundown because I know Kathleen went into a lot more detail the other day, um, and what I this really is about how we use this methodology of testing whether it was things were a good idea that lean startup model iterative try something does it work does the market like it or does the user like it if they do let's keep doing it and we decided we were going to try this on marketing process um, and so what I want to show to you now is a marketing process that we went through um, we came up with a crazy idea and we couldn't afford to make this crazy idea real so actually what we did was we we tried it with a bunch of free services I'm going to tell you how we did that and how you can do similar things so we run a company that prints t-shirts right we're not super innovative like we don't have um, this uh, there's lots of people who print t-shirts. We have a website that makes it super easy for people to create t-shirts and buy, right? But we're a startup company. We're bootstrapped. We don't have any cash. So how do we, how do we, how do we make ourselves visible, right? How can we make ourselves easy to find? Like SEO takes a long time. Advertising is expensive. Like Google and Facebook ads is very, very competitive for what we do. So we thought maybe if we do like cold email and cold email is just where you send someone an email and say hey would you like to buy my service we all get cold emails every day and most of them are shit like almost all of them are really really terrible I get tons and so I said the only way I want to do this is if it's interesting and different and if we do something that other people haven't done before so the idea was that we would send people an email with their company logo on a t-shirt in the email. So they would receive an email that said their company name in a picture in the email, right? So Anya would receive one that says, uh, it just has a Brainster logo on it. Uh, Nina from Swiss EP would have one with a Swiss EP logo on it. And whatever your company is, you receive that. But that that's an amazing idea because it catches people's attention, right? But it's very difficult to do and it's hard work to do, especially if you want to make it automatic. So, this is, this is the most important question you can ever ask yourself in business, I think. And it's what is the quickest way we can test our hypothesis for no money? So what happens is, and our hypothesis is like um, an idea, uh, a theory, and our hypothesis was that people would respond well to seeing their company logo on a t-shirt and they would be more likely to buy. That was our hypothesis, right? So what we had done is we had used the mom test idea to like find out, find the problems that people had around t-shirt printing and built a website for those. And this was about making the service and the marketing even better, slowly and steadily. So what's the quickest way we can test our hypothesis that people will respond well to a picture of their company logo on a t-shirt for no money. And again, this can be a product, it can be any process, it can be a market, it can be something, you know, anything in your life. So we did it manually. So what would have happened is normally I would have gone to my, um, to my co-founder, Milen, uh, our CTO, and said to him, hey Milen, can you build us a system that does all this automatically? And he rightfully would have said, no, you're crazy because that's going to take a lot of time and effort and we don't know if it works. So what me and uh, my uh, colleague Ramina did um, was we did it manually. So we found all the logos using Google and Twitter. I know Twitter's not like super well used in the Balkans, um, but what we did was we kind of Twitter's really good because it makes the logos the the logo icon like on Facebook you can just get their company logo really quickly and easily so we use that to get the logos 
We use Photoshop to create mock-ups, like fake versions of their T-shirt. And then we emailed them. And that was it. And we did 50 people, I think. So we emailed 50 people. And this like took like eight hours in total to do all of this. Manually type all the emails, do all the Photoshop. Now we sent 50 emails. 50% of them got opened. Now, 50% doesn't sound like a lot, but actually for a cold email, a 50% open rate is really quite high. Like normally you get a lot lower open rate. Anyone who's done any cold emailing or, or newsletter emails will know it's much, much lower than that. But after 50 emails, we got some nice emails back saying, hey, love your email, it's really clever, really funny, but we don't need t-shirts, right? And then, but we didn't sell anything. We got a load of replies, but we didn't sell anything. So we were like, okay, so this took eight hours, but there was enough of a signal there, there was enough of an idea there that we thought it's worth doing again. Because in like of those 50 people we emailed, like two or three emailed back and went, this is a really, really great cold email. Really great. We love it. But none of them bought anything, right? But if we wanted to do it again, we wanted to do like a bigger sample size, right? You know, in, in whenever you're testing anything, if you can get the more you can do, the more reliable your results, right? So what's the quickest way that we can automate this? Just a bit, right? So we used a, an API called Clearbit, and that allowed us to get all the logos. So we could upload it like 250 uh, company names and we got 250 logos. We used Placeit, which allowed us to get like 250, um, quickly create all these t-shirt with the logos on and you'll see some more of those in a minute. And then Duck Soup and there's things like Hunter, which allow you to get like email addresses, right? They're not necessarily the right person in the organization, but they're definitely someone who works there, right? So, this is basically what we were sending out. We just uploaded a load of logos, 250, and it took us like another day. Once we'd automated this a little bit, we found this system and you know, we were able to do like another 250 in a day, right? So we did this automatically. We sent 250 emails, again, about a 50% open rate. But amongst all those great replies, we had loads and loads of great replies, we sold 850 pounds worth of t-shirts. Yes, yes. We kind of had a signal, right? That something was working. And that was really, really important. Okay, something is working. We can spend more time on this. So we're thinking, right, if we send 250 emails, we get 850 pounds of revenue. We knew what our profit margins were. So we could kind of work out what, how, many t um, how many emails we would need to sell in order to make this like a scalable, viable marketing strategy, right? Um, because we still, this was the whole thing. It's like, it was a good idea, but now we were finding out it might be a good marketing business or it might be a good marketing process. Right, so this, remember, the, the whole thing is about this entire process can be applied to a business. This isn't just about marketing, this is about business as well. You can use these processes to test whether people are interested in a product. So, the next question was, how can we make this a little bit more automatic? So this was the time I sat down with my co-founder and my CTO, Milen, and said, Milan, can you build an automatic system that sends thousands of emails? And he kind of went away and he was like, yeah, I think I can, but it's going to take like, it's going to take time, but we can do it, right? Okay, great. So we came up with an idea. If we're going to do it, we want the response rate to be as good as possible. And the next, the next version, the next iteration was to improve the image of the white t-shirt, right? To get what's the best possible white, white t-shirt image we could use. So we'd had like these good looking guys, these kind of models um, wearing these fake t-shirts that we were sending to companies. Um, actually, before I go to the next stage, it's really important, like if anybody 
has any questions or there's anything they don't understand or I'm talking too fast, please just say so in the chat. Like it's fine, you can you can say that. Um, or if, if you need clarification on anything. Um, I, I know I speak, I have a, uh, I, I speak a little bit fast sometimes, especially when I'm excited. So um, what's the quickest way that we can make this a little bit better and automate it a little bit more? So we thought the email has to be so good and we thought the image should include basically the person wearing that person's company logo should be the most handsome, good looking, incredible human being on the planet. So we decided on this guy. <laughs> of course, I am uh, I'm not quite as good looking as all the other guys that we've been putting t-shirts on. But it's really, really powerful when I'm the CEO of the company sending you t-shirts, right? Sending you a picture of me wearing your company t-shirt. Imagine if you got that in your email. Hey, I'm wearing your t-shirt. I'm wearing your company t-shirt. Hey, the sun has come out. That's how much, that's how successful this was. Um, so yeah, we just had this thing where we were just like, I was sending images of myself wearing other people's company t-shirts, thousands and thousands of emails. And all only because we knew that it definitely worked. Because there was just no no reason to, to do it otherwise. It would have been way too expensive, way too time consuming to do that unless we really knew the process worked, right? So yeah, this is what it started to look like. So the email starts out with, hey, nobody likes cold emails, do they? So to make this a little less awkward, here's a photo of me in your company t-shirt. And what that did was that just acknowledged that, hey, you know, we kind of, it sucks a little bit to get cold emails sometimes, but the reality is I'm wearing your company t-shirt, so you're gonna pay attention. And they really did pay attention. The next bit is like, to make it even less awkward, I'm putting the unsubscribe link here, instead of hiding it away at the top, bottom of the email. That gives them trust straight away that we're not trying to scam them. It's just like, hey, if you don't wanna hear from us again, that's absolutely fine. And then there was some more stuff we put in, like about what we do, how we, how we operate. Um, this was a tweet that somebody said, so one of our unique selling points is that we work really, really quickly. Um, and somebody tweeted that, hey, I just ordered t-shirts in two minutes and 17 seconds. So we put that tweet in the email and people really, really liked that as well. But one thing that we did notice was I was getting, at this point, I was getting lots and lots and lots of replies from people saying, this is great. We were selling t-shirts, people were loving our email. They're really, really impressed. But one thing um, that we didn't really know, realize was that lots of people were emailing us back and saying, this is great, we love your email, how much are the t-shirts? And one of the main things about our company is that you can get the prices instantly on our website and check out and do the whole process super, super easy, like that tweet just said. But people were still, still emailing back and going, how much are the t-shirts? So we'd obviously got the message wrong. So we changed the email and we put a big blue button in, which you can see sort of over there somewhere, that says, get prices. We thought we were being obvious, but we weren't obvious enough, so we had to put a big button in there. So, these are the results. These are the kind of emails I was getting back on a daily basis. I don't know how if you can read these, so I'm just going to quickly read them. Hey Neil, this is the best cold email I've received. That's hilarious, I'm in. Congrats, you're in best pitch of the year. I'm not interested, but that's a fucking brilliant sales email. Um, you win best cold email ever received. Really like the site too. Made me smile and made me order. Good marketing. Yes, I love them when they order. Um, the top one there says top five best cold email ever received. I was a bit offended by the fact that there were four better cold emails than mine. Uh, this is the best cold email I've ever seen, and we send out tens of thousands of them, so we've brainstormed pretty hard how well to do them. Best cold email I've ever received. You made me smile. That may have been the best cold email I've ever received. This is the best cold email I've ever read. Uh, I've ever read. Out of all the cold emails I've ever received, this is by far the best. I have hundreds of those emails, hundreds and hundreds. And yes, it's nice to get replies like this, but more importantly, 
we were selling t-shirts we're a business right it was really really important that we were selling t-shirts otherwise we go out of business we might have an amazing marketing idea we have this ability to test ideas and prove that they have value but unless we sell t-shirts it's all irrelevant not everyone really liked what we were doing WTF this is horrible you're taking a picture of yourself with a falsified t-shirt of mine are you mad please do not send me an email again I would suggest not to do this to others I am just appalled by this and underneath look my friend this logo is protected under copyright um, any email that starts with look my friend is never a good email so not everyone was happy but this is like we had like three or four out of like thousands of emails and then we had some funny responses as well um, people kind of photoshopped stuff back to us and sort of sent us um, this guy's Walter White obviously most of you will recognize him put the ramp logo on his uh, tighty whities and then this guy photoshopped a picture of me on a t-shirt that he's wearing um, but I'm wearing his t-shirt in the picture so it's kind of a weird inception t-shirt thing going on on the left here they photoshopped me into a basically an apron which is like um, you know a thing for cooking and uh, it says this is genuinely excellent cold call campaign even more so I appreciate the effort you've gone to in explaining it your targeting was off with us as we are a chef uniform company and can print our own t-shirts but if you ever need a nice designer made British made apron check us out and they make a really important point like when you automate your marketing when you scale up inevitably your targeting gets wide as well you get less and less targeted because we were sending thousands of emails so like we couldn't possibly target and actually we hit somebody here with a with a targeted email that wouldn't be interested in our product because they can print their own stuff they're a, they're a clothing company right so that's really really important to understand um, so you have to bear that in mind when you when you're going through that stuff um, and this guy on the right here is Randy he's in America um, and he loved our campaign so much I sent him a photo of me wearing his t-shirt printed onto a t-shirt that's actually a literal t-shirt that I sent him uh, and he hangs it in in his office as a reminder to be more innovative with their with their marketing so stage two and we mostly through the presentation now but uh, but the last few bits what's really important to to remember is and it's something that we learned and this is again you have to keep your ears open whether it's in business or your marketing processes or whatever it is that you do you have to keep your ears open for signals that are telling you you are doing something right and when you are doing that thing right do more of that thing so we wrote a blog post about this so we got so many people asking us how we did it why we did it what the process was that we basically decided that we were gonna write a blog post about it and I wrote this you can you can get the blog post there you can read it whenever you're ready um, that blog post then we posted on Facebook on reddit on Twitter that blog post sent more traffic than the email campaign did it sent hundreds of thousands of people to read that it got shared we regularly see spikes where people are like, oh check this out they found this amazing blog post and they post it in a Facebook group or in a Twitter marketing group or whatever so we didn't know that when we just I just wrote it so that I didn't have to write the same email to 50 people but all of a sudden we were getting loads and loads of traffic so it told us write more content when you do something cool write more content the point is respond to those positive signals when something goes right do more of it right so we actually wrote like several blog posts that basically said the same thing this blog post has been translated into French into German Italian Japanese uh, I think Spanish like people have just taken that content translated it and put it on their own site um, but we've also been asked to write it on different other blog posts uh, on other companies blogs so basically I've just reworded it written the same thing a couple same uh, in different ways and basically then now in a situation where we have our content all over the internet it drives traffic all the time and obviously not many of those people convert because lots of them uh, people are interested in marketing but some of them do and also we can retarget them because our cookie lands on their page so like for weeks after they kind of get followed by that thing around the website that hey do you want to buy 
t-shirts, you know, when they're on Facebook, the advert comes up, all that stuff. Um, and it's just a bit of a feedback loop, really. It just kind of, you can keep driving traffic and getting people interested. One uh, interesting thing um, we did was, for a while, we, we had to stop doing this for boring technical reasons, was people who read the email were able to get an example sent to them. So you could actually put your company email address in and you would get a few hours later a photo of me wearing your company logo on a t-shirt. So actually people are asking us to send us a sales email. So we, people were volunteering to receive sales emails from us. It was incredible, absolutely amazing. Um, so that worked really, really well. Um, and then these are all the social things. So, you know, these are tweets where, you know, you can see obviously all exactly the same email uh, that everyone's receiving, but they're talking about it because they're just really impressed and they tweet about it and that drives more traffic back. And it's just this loop keeps driving traffic back. And then finally, I, I've, you know, I've been, I've given this talk all over Europe. People have um, asked me to come and talk at events all over Europe. And this is again more, you know, so when you do something cool, write about it tweet about it and actually if nobody comes to that content then you know you're doing the wrong thing but I keep getting asked to keep doing the talks and even though we don't earn any money from doing the talks because I you know it, nobody pays people to do the talks right but actually people learn about our business through doing this and you know hopefully one day one of you will recommend uh, us to a friend or you know you'll be interested in buying from us yourself um, and you know all of that helps so Kind of to wrap up really about this so we used customer questions really the right customer questions that mom test stuff you know think back to Kathleen's uh, webinar the other day ask the right questions of your customers I think to yourself are you pitching them or are you asking them problems that allow them to tell you? Ask, are you asking them questions that allow you to tell you, allow them to tell you what their problems are? Because they need to tell you. So an example with the with the glass of water, right? I came up with three examples of terrible ideas for stopping me spilling a drink. But actually, if I'd gone and spoken to 50 people in advance, I said, Talk to me about your day and how you, how you deal with getting drinks and do you ever get thirsty and do you have any problems when you get your drink and would you like your drinks to come to you faster and how do you feel when you get a drink? I probably would have found that like nobody ever mentioned, oh, I'm always spilling my drinks and that's a problem. I bet you no one ever mentions that if you ask them in the right way. But actually, maybe 20% of them would have said, like I get very often, I think you probably do as well, you sat at your email, uh, sat at your desk working, you think, I'm a bit thirsty, right? But then you forget because you're doing an email and then you do something else and then you do something else and you're like, actually, there might be something there. If 20% of the people said to you, oh, I, um, I'm always thirsty, but I never think to get up to get a drink, that might be a problem. If 20% of people are saying that's a real problem for you when you ask the right questions, there might be a solution that they need there, like, I know, drinks delivered to your desk or a device on your desk that dispenses a certain amount of water every few minutes or whatever it is. Those are obviously maybe terrible ideas, but, but you get my point. So validate your idea through the right customer journeys and then you do the secondary validation. You do the, the checking by building the smallest, simplest thing you can to see whether people are interested to see basically whether people will click on your stuff. And so what you can do is like, um, you can use free and cheap processes, like nothing that we did until we started building the technology, everything we did cost less than $50, like getting the logos, using Photoshop, all these things, sending the emails. It took me and Romina like a bunch of hours to send those out, but it was free. And what it did was it proved that people were interested. Then we went and built this automated system that did like hundreds and hundreds of images and emails at a time. So the things that we learned were speak to your customers in the right way. Make sure you take a, a iterative process. Don't just go and build a crazy big thing straight away. 
use free and cheap services that are on the internet. I'm happy to give ideas about, if you have an idea, what, what you can uh, do um, to test those ideas. It's, I spend a lot of time with uh, new entrepreneurs testing ideas, helping them understand how to do that. One thing that we really realized was email, when you do it like this, is like a funnel. Like, so the first thing we had to do was get them to open the email. And we did that through a brilliant subject line, which was, hey, I'm wearing a your company t-shirt. So I'm wearing a Brainster t-shirt, or I'm wearing a Swiss EP t-shirt, or I'm wearing a you know, Scopia t-shirt, whatever your company name is. Imagine that being in there. I'm wearing a t-shirt. You're probably going to open that email, right? So that's the first bit. And then the next bit of the funnel is getting them interested in the email. And then a picture of me like looking dorky there is like, that's obviously going to get them interested because company logos there, right? And then the next thing is to get them to click. And then when you get to the website, then next, you know, you've got to get them through the funnel until they eventually buy. And eventually, obviously, it's only like a small percentage of people that receive the email that buy, but you've got to think like that. Think to yourself at every stage, what would make me open an email or what would make me click? It might be for your app. What would make me download and install this email? Like, is it a big enough problem that I would, um, this app, if you have an idea for an app, would I download and install this app? Is it a big enough problem? Um, and you don't need to be a technology genius to do all this stuff. Most of this stuff is like plug and play now, right? It's like, I'm not a coder, I'm not a developer, but I did all this stuff before I took it to Milan. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of it. That's the the main part of my presentation. So obviously, if any of you now have any sort of questions or if there's anything I can help with, I'd be delighted to, to sort of see if there's anything else I can help with or, you know, just shout. If you have any questions, just say so. I'm going to check the chat over here. So, uh, yeah, greatest problem I think for everybody is who do we ask our questions to for the certain idea? Um, I think Kathleen addressed this. I don't know if you're able to check that, but you've got to try and find people who are in your target audience. Try and be as direct as possible. Um, I'd strongly recommend, um, uh, I mean, God, uh, Rob Fitzpatrick's book, The Mom Test, it goes into this in detail, you know. Um, but the reality is you should be able to find, if you genuinely think you have a solution to a problem, you should be able to find people who are having that problem. Otherwise, how did you get the idea for that problem? If you can say to yourself, I, I know there's millions of people around the world who would want this product, then you should be able to find those people. Um, sometimes a case of just looking on Facebook or, but you have, to, you have to be really, really careful not to pitch your product. The amount of times I've been, someone sat down with me with a, and they said, Hey, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. Would you use it? I don't, I don't really know. Cause I don't know what future me is going to do, but what I can tell you is whether I'm having a problem with a certain thing. Because I don't know what your product is and I don't know how, how well it's going to solve my problem. So I don't know if I'm going to give you $10 a month or whatever. Right. But what I can tell you is that, yes, I do have a problem sometimes with this issue. 
And yes, if you can find a really smart way to solve that, and it, there is a resistance to changing your behavior or spending money. We all resist doing those things. We like doing the things we do, and we don't like spending money. So in order to get people to change their behavior, you have to create a solution to their problem that's basically better than that resistance. Um, next question, Anya, uh, marketing research or testing hypothesis? Um, sometimes they're the same thing. Um, I think uh, they're slightly different things, but the processes you can use are exactly the same. Um, sometimes you do the research. So market research for me is, is kind of more around understanding the size of the market, how many people could be using, whether, what age groups they are. This is testing your hypothesis, is really getting into them and speaking to them, understanding who these people are and what problems they experience. Um, Igor says, how do you collect the email list of the different employees? Um, yeah, so I, I touched on a couple of, um, there's Duck Soup and Hunter. They're really, really good. You can buy lists. We didn't buy lists. Again, like with Hunter and Duck Soup, they allow you to put in the company domain. So say something like, uh, let's say google.com, and it will go and it will find you a load of email addresses from people from Google but you don't know that they are necessarily the right people that you want to contact. So you can either do a very automated way of saying, right, find me 100 uh, email addresses for this company, say Google, or you can spend, if you want someone very, very specific, you can just go and look on LinkedIn or Twitter. A really nice um, example is sometimes people tweet their email addresses to other people. So if you search for their username plus email, um, sometimes that will show up. Um, it depends how targeted you want to be. Um, we actually found sometimes we were able to scrape event um, attendee lists, and that was actually really successful um, because people tend to buy T-shirts when they go into events. So we would like find this big conference and go like, oh, right, okay. Um, uh, there's a list, and sometimes they would publish the list of 500 people who are attending, or maybe just the speakers. And so that would be a good starting point. So sometimes it's quite labor intensive quite hard to get those lists other times we would just say look let's we would upload like a hundred company domains brainster.com google.com facebook.com and we would just email whoever our system hunter or duck Soup, would would bring back so we have no idea necessarily and that's why conversion rates are low and like i say the wider you spread your net the lower your conversion rates but if you want to spend like two hours looking for ex the exact right person's email address, you will probably get a much, much better conversion rate, but you're doing fewer people. So it's kind of, you can either do that for that or that for that. It's like, sometimes it's the same thing. Um, Sophia, uh, oh, sorry, Peter, oh, hang on a sec, right? There's quite a few here, right? Hang on a sec, let's try and get through these quickly. Uh, how do you sell the idea of selling ideas? What is your advice to creative business entrepreneurs? Really, really quick, quick with that one, Suash. Everything we talked about in terms of like finding out what people's problems are, solve a problem. Here's the big thing. So, fall in love with solving a problem. Don't fall in love with your product because if you fall in love with your solution or your product, that's it. You're stuck with that. And if it doesn't solve a problem, no one's going to use it. If you fall in love with a problem, you are much, much better placed to solve it in the right way for people. Um, I really like your story. It's really inspiring. I'd like to ask you, where did you get the inspiration for the content for your business model? Um, the inspiration for the content for your business model. Ah, so you're talking about our blog posts and content. That's really difficult. Con uh, t-shirt sell. There's, there's thousands of people around the world who sell t-shirts. We and print and sell t-shirts. We just do it slightly differently. Um, it's really difficult to work on SEO. Um, so we don't try and compete a lot. We have a couple of really, really strong SEO bits of content, but generally it's quite difficult to, to compete there. Um, so we don't put out lots of content, but when we do, we try and make it really focused and we talk about us um, and stuff that's shareable. Like this blog post that I linked to earlier, that's so shareable. Like so hundreds of thousands of people have read that post um ba -ba -bum. sophia during the presentation you talk about asking the right questions for five ways to solve a problem however what if your product service represents an opportunity in the market um don't 100 understand that sophia um 
However, what if your product or service represents an opportunity in the market? Are you saying that it's completely new um, and nobody has this problem anymore? That's a really, really good question, actually, if that's the question you're asking. Um, I don't know. I'd have to come back to you on that um, because I need some time to think about that and we don't have much time left. Um, I would go with LinkedIn also because on their profile, their position and companies displayed. Yes, great way to get leads. What if you start checking one problem, throw right questions and find out another bigger problem concerning people? Do you end up changing the product and making a new one? Yes, 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 yes. That's exactly what this is about. 100% if you find a bigger problem. It's okay to say no. Like if you don't like that problem and you don't think you want to solve it because it might be something you're not interested in, you're not, that's okay to make that decision. But there is nothing worse than solving a problem here and getting like tiny results and then realizing five years later when you've closed the business down because it failed that there was a huge problem just here. So yes, that's exactly right. If you find there is a bigger problem just there, chase that problem. Because the bigger the problem, the bigger, more money people are willing to spend, the more people are willing to come on board with you. So here's a good example. If I locked everybody in the room and you couldn't, couldn't get out of the room and there's a hundred of you in the room and have a handful of vitamin tablets and a handful of painkillers. Now imagine if like three of you got a headache and we were going to be there for 10 hours. How many people would spend $10 on the vitamins? But if you had a headache, which is a much, much bigger, more immediate problem than needing vitamins, those people are going to spend $10 on, a, on headache tablets, right? And of course, vitamins is a big market, but it's not an urgent market. They sell it in a different way. But if a problem that needs to be solved now is really important, I'm locked in this room for 10 hours and I need, I've got $10 and you have headache tablets, I'm giving you $10. I can wait till I get home to have my vitamin tablets. Um, is there a catch or a faster way of identifying the people needed for you to access the targeted solution of the problem to get a faster appraisal of the poss possible solution? Um, people need for you to get a fuck. So what you're saying is, is what's the quickest way to find the right people? Honestly, Rob, the guy who wrote that book, tells a story of like these entrepreneurs who come to him and said, oh, we can't find people to speak to, blah, blah, blah. And they were meeting in a hotel lobby. And Rob just stood up on a chair and says, hey, does anyone have any problems with like scheduling meetings or whatever the problem was? And a guy in the corner went, yeah. And he went, great, can we buy you a coffee? And it's like, honestly, I think if you can't find those people, I'd argue that you're not looking hard enough. But maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Uh, I don't want to be rude. I'm going to very quickly close my curtains because this sun is really bright now. <coughs> okay, hopefully that's a bit better. Right. Um, hey, Igor, uh, what do you think? How smart is to use humour or cruel to be a black sheep in your campaign if you sell a really competitive... Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, you know, when you're in a really competitive uh, area like us, it really helped to stand out. And that was one of um, one of the reasons we did stand out because most T-shirt printing companies try and be cool or they try and be like cool designs or, you know, we, you know, hipsters or whatever. Like we didn't try that. Like I look kind of dorky in that photo of me. So if you find and see the photo of me, like... I look a bit kind of dorky, I'm smiling, and I'm kind of not even stood straight, I'm kind of stood leaning to one side. So, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, it's kind of, uh, you've got to be different sometimes. And if you look at some of the best marketing campaigns, like I'm, I do a lot of work in marketing, but there's some real marketing geniuses. Um, it's worth spending time and money to be different if you're in a very competitive market. Um, yeah, the advice is to be different, but um, that's kind of uh, 
it's easy to say that, right? It's, it's, it, like everyone wants to be different, and everyone tries to be different, but that's actually a lot more difficult to do than it sounds. And it's kind of shit advice, really, because it's like, hey, just be different. That's not easy. But yeah, the more competitive your sector, the more different you're going to have to be. Um, Andre, you, did, you didn't uh, you didn't chase me away, um, but yeah, you uh, you you know it's it's um, if you like if you struggle to if you have a product that you're really struggling to find people to speak to, ask yourself, is this a big enough product, or is this a big enough solution? You know, or is this a big enough problem? If I can't find people, then how am I going to find them to sell to them? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Um, right, what else have we got? I think there are no more questions. Are there any questions that I have missed? Oh, sorry, uh, Boyan, how to know what to price your product? I'm not an expert in that. Uh, there is, you can use this process of just trying. Like I know if you, if you especially if you sell digital products, and you can afford to just move the price around. Like if you're selling an online course, just try different product. Just try different prices. Physical products are a different, bit more difficult. So with t-shirts, we have like, um, uh, we have set costs and we can't get away from those. Um, but yeah, use this process. Try those things. And you know, you can, it's a bit difficult sometimes if you find a problem with a customer. You say, so, so how much would you pay for that? Um, one thing you can do is sometimes ask what they are currently doing to solve that problem and how much they're paying for it. That's a good way in sometimes to just get an idea. Uh, but again, it totally depends on the product. Um, Andre, faster way being the key there. Um, yeah, um, maybe a faster way of finding the people. It dep totally depends on the product, but there will be if your thing is around um, farming, there are organizations of farmers, there are Facebook groups of farmers, there are Twitter groups of farmers, there are people who follow farmers on Instagram. There are, it's never been easier to find groups of people that you wanna to speak to because we, we're tribes, we follow where the thing we're interested in is. So um, Facebook groups is a great one. There's Facebook groups for everything. Um, so, you know, even a really, really weird niche thing, you will probably find there is a Facebook group for it. Um, I hope that answers your question, but if not, you've got, you know, email me. I'm, I'm more than happy to, uh, go into more detail there. Um, so it, have I missed anybody's questions? Uh, Anya, is there anything else? Nina? And yes, I should have worn a Brainster t-shirt, Amelia. I, uh, but unfortunately, none of those t-shirts ever existed. They're all just digital, right? We just, I'm just wearing a boring ramp t-shirts t-shirt today. So uh, sadly, sadly, that's it. Um, thank you, everyone. If there's no more questions, um, you can, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. You've got my email address. Uh, the company is uh, rampt-shirts.com. We don't even have the uh, URL in here anywhere. That's terrible. Um, so that's really bad marketing. But, you know, uh, I'm more than happy to help. Just drop me a line. Um, thank you very much. Very kind. Um, yeah, look forward to seeing you all soon. And I want to come back and visit Skopje for my third visit um, and visit your crazy city centre which is kind of feels like the Disneyland of old stuff. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Skopje uh, and I ran the half marathon there the year before. And so I'm looking forward to coming back again soon. So see you guys. Take care. Bye.